I'm triggered. <laughs> I'm triggered. So it's not there at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Couch Busters. We're so excited to have you here today. Today, we have a guest, my really good friend, Sujin, from college. Hello. And we've been friends for like over 10 years, about 10 years? Over 10 years. Over 10 years. Yeah, now. I think this is our 14th year. Oh my gosh. 14th That's, year of friendship? No way. That's, That's crazy. Wild, actually. Because we first met 2010. 2010 when you, because you were uh, one yes, year younger uh -huh. than me came into um, college yeah yeah dang what was she like in college what were you guys both like in college because i don't have any context you know prior to us <laughs> meeting in dc that's funny you got your friends your texas friends Ask just today. asked me that same yeah. question today oh, really? and i answered a lot of michelle is the same i think like Essence the core wise. of her personality is the same but with even more energy yeah and i was even like, more drive to hang out yeah i like had no limit which is unbelievable because I feel like the the drive right now is pretty, pretty limitless. But this is I was yeah. saying I feel like you tone her down a little bit. Really? Like I you toned guys her down. Balance each other out a little bit. Well, oh. you're welcome then because <laughs> one of the photos I still crack up about cuz oh I just like gosh. remember. I can't even find this photo anymore, but it's her wearing like a parasail helmet <laughs> or cap. I had, I was like I had no shame in college. We'll pull it up. We'll pull remember, it up on the actual I, video. We got a it's right here so on funny. If we yeah, get it's like hilarious. 500 views on our next episode before this one, we'll reveal the picture <laughs> we'll reveal it regardless not like the best look college but. is just a weird time <laughs> yeah i also like, gained like 18 pounds so i also did too like legit you were like pounds. tiny though yeah but you were a stick i never lost it after college it's okay you yeah. look good <laughs> <laughs> but sujin was you were like i thought you were the biggest extrovert which is funny because you're yeah. an introvert uh -huh. you were also everywhere but then she was a lot more studious <laughs> she was so good at staying on top of her things I feel like I'm one of those people whose personality changed a lot. Yeah, in I college. think you changed. I came in, like we were talking about Myers Briggs. I came in as a strong ESFJ. Yeah, that's crazy. But now I'm like, my eye is almost 100%. <laughs> what? I'm like really? A INFJ. Yeah. You transitioned fully to the other side? Yeah, and it happened in college. Like Michelle said, mm -hmm. I think freshman year, I was kind of everywhere. She I was hung the out freshman everywhere. that everyone knew. <laughs> And really? she was like kind of everyone's favorite. No. There's always that one freshman <laughs> then, in every class. Yeah. Because I was for just sure. hanging out yeah. with people. But uh -huh. then I think by junior year, I was like pretty off to the side. Yeah. I Did wasn't at the hang something out. hard. <laughs> it's another podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's actually a perfect transition into what we wanted to talk about today. Like transition in terms of friendships, in terms of mm -hmm. personal identity, your career trajectory. As everyone knows, or Maybe we haven't really divulged this, but Michelle and I, we're in our 30s. Sujin too, also 30s, right? Yeah. Um, early 30s. Early 30s. But yes, clarify. we wanted to spend today talking about that transition period because it's so different for everybody. It's difficult for some, really easy for others. Actually, take that back. I don't think it's easy for anybody. I've never heard of anyone yeah. who had like smooth sailing into their yeah, 30s. Yeah, yeah. But kind of wanted yeah. to divulge a little bit of our experiences into what shaped your 20s and the person that you are today into three topics. Number one, the transition from 20s to 30s in a general sense. Mm -hmm. Next is this concept of this quarter life crisis that everyone's been talking about and kind of experiencing. And finally, this idea of delayed adulthood. <laughs> All right. So sp starting with the first topic here, the transition from 20s to 30s, you guys kind of talked about it in terms of you being the wild child, toning it down, but not really toning it down. And then Sujin, you being this other person entirely based on Myers-Briggs. Yeah, that's and, pretty interesting. Yeah, being an introvert now, like how has that transition been? Like where are you now kind of? I don't know. I feel like I changed so much in college yeah. and I've in some ways, I've been pretty consistent since then. I think so. Yeah. So maybe a lot of change happened going from teens to 20s. <laughs> yeah. um, but I feel like the 20s to 30s for me was more of... Because I feel like when you're 20, 30 sounds so far away. Mm -hmm. mm. And 30 sounds really old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For all 20-year-olds watching. I know. Yeah. 30's yeah. not that old. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. old. It's so crazy. Because I used to have, uh, when I was a freshman, I was part of a campus fellowship. And it was being taught by alumni who were 26 at the time. And I was like, 26? These guys are ancient. <laughs> and you like, kind of look doing? at them as real adults. Yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah. now you know they didn't know anything. Yeah. When yeah. I look back on like what I did as a 25, 26 years, I'm mm -hmm. like, you knew nothing. Yeah. 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 
But I feel like part of what made the transition hard without e- me even being aware of it was that you just put a lot of expectations for what 30 will be mm. without even articulating it. And then you hit 30 and you go through it and you just kind of realize it's just not what you had expected. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what were some of those expectations <laughs> for yourself? Like in yeah. college, you were like, oh, Sujin, by the time you're 30, yeah. I'm going to be X, Y, Z. Did you yeah. have that? I mean, I don't think I ever had like grand dreams for myself, like I'm going to be, you know, this kind of successful or whatnot. But I think on a baseline, maybe a lot of people think this is I just assume like I'm going to have a family by the time I'm 30. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to have a I'm going to be really settled at like a job, like a career. Right. Mm. That I feel confident in. Mm -hmm. Um I'm going to have like a solid group of friends at that point that mm-hmm. I'm just doing the rest of my life with. And in a lot of ways, those things just don't pan out the way you expect. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that. And I think what's interesting is like when I look back at my 20s, it's not like I regret anything mm-hmm. particularly. Right. And it's not like I had a bad experience in my 20s. Uh-huh. Like I switched jobs multiple times, but I would never take that back. You know, like. I love the way that I was able to like travel a lot and not get tied down to like, mm-hmm. a family at that point. Or I love like the experiences we had in our twenties mm-hmm. with our friends. But so I think what's interesting is I don't necessarily feel like the transition was hard because I didn't spend my twenties in the ways that I ne- I wanted. But that makes me realize the expectations of the thirties are so strongly engraved in you, mm-hmm. maybe from like culture and what you see on media Mm. you just grow up and everyone thinks like 30 seems like a good age to say you're an adult and you should have (laughs) these things as an adult Mm -hmm. and so i think for me it was like i really enjoyed my 20s and i happily entered my 30s and then all of a sudden it just kind of hit me like oh well Mm. these are not the things that i thought i would have yeah where'd this come from and not that i don't like these things but why am i still like disappointed you know why am i yeah why am i still struggling why do i struggle to feel kind of like settled and secure. Uh So it makes me wonder, um, like, what is it that makes us have those expectations? And like, I think we were talking about this yesterday. It's also because in your 20s, it is tumultuous and you kind of like expect Expect it to be tumultuous. And Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of ups and downs, like you're figuring things out. You don't quite know who you are. That's why you end up getting like a lot of like going through a lot of heartbroken moments. And Mm. I think like in your thirties and I did feel this too, when I went into like entered my thirties, I was like, I feel a lot more confident and secure Mm. in who I am. Mm. And I feel like I've gone through a lot of ups and downs and trials and tribulations and worked through it Mm -hmm. to feel like, okay, I kind of, I like know who I am. This is what I'm comfortable about myself. Mm -hmm. And like, these are my weaknesses and what I want to work on or what I need to accept. Mm. And so that gives, that gave me, I think, like a not a false sense of security but almost in that like okay i kind of have things figured out yeah and then there's other things that are coming that we don't think to think about or like Mm -hmm. expect Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i think that's why it's like whoa what's Mm -hmm. happening (laughs) right so we touched upon this topic of you know career shifts and you know just not knowing what you want to do in life and it's like a perfect segue into this quarter life crisis kind of notion right and it's something that a lot of people have been talking more and more about recently and it sounds like everyone here kind of went through their own variation mm-hmm. of that I sure did care to divulge a little bit more i don't maybe my quarter life crisis is why i got into a bad relationship <laughs> mm, yeah and also why i wish i had more dating experience yeah so how I'm do you triggered <laughs> i'm triggered she's on, on, your, me. on her she's behalf on her. yeah yeah all of it so before you Love before you. <laughs> you go into it like how do you define your quarter life crisis what does that mean to you well i think i it's not literally 25 right for me i think it's just that like mid-20s range mm-hmm. and if i had to really pinpoint when i went through it, i think it did happen like maybe my late 20s yeah and it was a result of kind of going getting out of like a bad relationship and Mm -hmm. then at the same time i think i was like really questioning in my career what is it that i want to do and my status i'm not satisfied at my current job i had been there for like five years that was my first job and um and then it was just this point of really reevaluating like everything kind of happening in my life and i realized like 
well, besides getting out of the bad relationship, I realized like I don't, I want to do something I'm happy about doing. And Mm -hmm. I've had these notions of like, what do I think is success? Like, what do I feel like I really need to accomplish in my life to make it meaningful or like feel satisfied? And then I, I actually had a career coach at one point. Did you really? Through my through my uh, job, which was really amazing. And I think that person was very crucial in helping me kind of like redefine these definitions I had in my head that weren't necessarily my own Hmm. and that were kind of like ingrained in me, whether it's through like my parents or society. And again, it's not like bad things, but sometimes you just need to take a step back Mm -hmm. and really ask yourself like, do I agree with this? Mm. Like, is this what I want for myself? And like, if I'm unhappy pursuing this quote unquote idea of success that I thought I had to achieve, then maybe I'm have the wrong idea of success. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really critical point in me kind of being, allowing myself to pursue the design field and pursue UX design and get into like a more creative field for myself. Cause I realized that's the only time when I'm really satisfied in what mm. I'm doing. So for you, the midlife, cri- or midlife, <laughs> the, uh, the quarter life crisis was all about kind of coming to terms with success, like your terms yeah. of success. And like what I thought would make me happy. Mm, for yeah. sure. Is it similar to your story? Yeah. I don't know. I, as a, you're like, I'm l- listening to you. I feel like I had kind of, like such a typical millennial uh-huh. quarter life crisis. <laughs> Truly, when I was like 24, going to 25, um, that was more triggered by I was on a really kind of toxic work environment, mm, and yes. my manager was. I I don't even know have the words to describe her, but there was one day where we were in a conference room. And she got so angry, she threw the conference phone across the room. What? And I don't I, remember this. Walked out of the office that day. I sat back at my cubicle and I literally, I booked a ticket. I booked <laughs> a your ticket cubicle? to like Korea or like Asia or whatever. So like I knew, I think it was like March and I knew I had um, like a friend's wedding in the West Coast at some point in the summer. So I was like, I'm going to go to Asia and just travel for like five weeks here. and then come back and go to this wedding. So I literally booked a ticket knowing i'm gonna quit yeah like i need to quit this is not sustainable like i just didn't know what i wanted to do with my life Mm -hmm. um but i think a lot of it was triggered by my work environment i wasn't necessarily so much like having an internal crisis at the time Mm -hmm. but i did this truly stereotypical millennial quit my job i quit my job and i went to travel (laughs) like yeah and i distinctly remember on the flight back from asia back to the west coast I was like, I started like tearing up in my eyes because I was like, what am I doing with my life? Uh-huh. This, is like, this was like a movie scene. I was like yeah. looking out the window <laughs> of so my plane. I was like, what am I doing? Because I was going back to no job. Yeah. And I just, I knew like, oh my gosh, my parents were probably so disappointed. And I also think that there's a little bit of, there was a lot of pressure on us, I think, because we went to like, you know, like a, a quote unquote good school. So everyone is kind of like looking at you too. How do you, how are you using your degree? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or like, you can't waste it. Yeah, I, I always hear people, you can't waste it. And so I felt a lot of pressure from that. Damn, um, must be nice. I never heard. <laughs> <laughs> like you come from GW, just yeah. you know? yeah. So I kind of like flew back home with no plans and like wow. I need to figure out what That's to do. That's ballsy. Yeah. yeah. Very I, bold. I, That's I commendable. Honestly, I don't know. I really don't know what got into me, but just did it, pulled the trigger. Um, but thankfully, God was really kind to me and like I was able to find a temporary job with someone I knew and um, in that time... I interviewed for other jobs and then within a couple months I was able to find a new job. Mm -hmm. Um, Career change or just within the same? It was a career change, yeah. So I was, um, for the first several years out of college, I was mostly doing nonprofit related work. Um, And then when I was looking for new jobs, I was like, I can't do this. (laughs) Try something new. And I just always knew I liked planning things. Mm -hmm. That's when I first went into an events related job. Hmm. Like as an events coordinator, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So that's kind of how I made a big career change. <laughs> wow, she's a great planner. That's what I, I hear. Yes. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, kind of 
are struggling to find the job that they're really passionate about because mm. they often start off in jobs that are quote unquote more secure according to someone else's definition of success right, right? and so it doesn't happen until later where they actually realize hey success on my terms means something different and i'm just going to kind of go for it at that point point. and according to what i've saw linkedin did a poll with like a couple thousand people and it turns out that 75 percent of 25 to 33 year olds have experienced a quarter-life crisis with the average age being 27. So it happens yeah, a little bit sense. after 25 when they're a little bit more settled into like that entry level role. Maybe they book a trip to Asia and they're just <laughs> like, dude, I got I to gotta do something completely different. Yeah. They've had enough of their first job. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting is that another top reason is comparing themselves to their more successful friends that they feel that they need to do a complete shift. Mm -hmm. Nearly half, 48% say this has caused them anxiety. But what's really interesting is that women feel this way more than men at 51% versus 41 for men. Why That's do you think difference. that is? Yeah, that is a big difference. Have you guys ever, like, have you felt this? Or I, maybe this is the first time you're kind of hearing the stat, but is this something that you can relate to? Like maybe not just for yourself, for other women? I think when it comes to my career, maybe, I mean, maybe, I feel like, I have had such a strange mm -hmm. career trajectory. <laughs> um, so like after I transitioned to like doing events, I knew since college, like I re I wanted to do um, like ministry, you know, mm. like, and after a couple of years, um, I did end up going to seminary and then interning at our church, getting a job at our church. And I was at the church for five years and five years yeah isn't that what? crazy yeah that went by so it fast. went by fast did you um, always know that you were being called to ministry i think it was in college yeah. when i first started feeling like um you know it was kind of gradual like i if started with i knew i really enjoyed ministry and then i think people were affirming the gifts around me and i felt a conviction to, mm -hmm, towards it mm -hmm. um but it took a long time, obviously, for me to like get to a point of like pulling the trigger and going forth with it. And then, you know, kind of long story, but there were a lot of circumstances where I ended up stepping away from my job at the church. And now I work for like a parachurch, right? Uh, like a nonprofit, a Christian nonprofit. So it, it is a different type of ministry, but in a way, because I've had to transition so much and not stay at one thing for a long time, I do think there's a part of me that felt like, it maybe if I did one thing out of college and just kept to it, I would be in a different place. Mm. I think when I transitioned out of the church job, I really struggled. I almost think I had another <laughs> quarter <down>. life <laughs> crisis where I, cause I really thought when I went into it, like I'm going to be in church ministry for a long mm. time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not lack of passion, but circumstances, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Uncontrollable circumstances. And, you end up transitioning. And so I felt really lost and like, mm -hmm. you know, what did I take this huge turn in my life for? Like, where am I going? And I remember I went on LinkedIn randomly. I don't even know why I was on LinkedIn, but I got like an email from my old account and I looked and one of my close friends from college, um, he, well, we were like friends in high school and in, in college, he had become a professor at our, our university. Oh, like at a, Cornell? Yeah, like two years ago. What? what? Wait, who? Um, well, he was a, like a high school oh, friend of mine. But I was just thinking like, <laughs> I can't believe someone my age is a professor. Is a professor. But I guess we're not that young anymore, but still. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> I, I, that was one thought I had. Yeah. But That's I also thought wild. like, yeah. it's just, it's crazy. Like in the time that I spent like, confused trying different jobs going to seminary and stuff mm. i was like someone else went and like got a phd and like did a lot of research mm. and you know it has a significant job and so i think that was the first time where i felt a little bit of what you're talking about dave of like man like other people are doing big things mm. with their lives mm. and i'm here kind of like struggling to figure out exactly what i'm supposed to be doing so i wanted to ask you about your thoughts on your experience when you were in ministry or actually like in seminary and going um, through that and then also working in the church setting because I, I think it's really rare to see like an Asian woman in ministry and I just wanted to ask you like how was it and like also did your perspective on life or like church or other people really change or get challenged when you were going through that the journey part of your life <laughs> it's a loaded question I know yeah I mean <laughs> um 
I feel like anyone who's kind of like walked with me in this journey knows that it was really good. Mm -hmm. Like there were a lot of parts I really enjoyed and I love our church and the staff that I was working with, but it was also really hard. Yeah. Um, I think in a lot of contexts, I think it's kind of like any industry or field where it's male dominated Mm -hmm. and being kind of like a female in that setting isn't easy. But I think in the church, there's also that kind of this layer of everyone kind of has their own interpretation of Mm. what they think women are allowed to do and aren't. And a lot of people haven't figured that out. And, you know, I think when you tie kind of some people's beliefs, like beliefs related to faith, it just gets very weighty and complex right and there's a lot of areas where it seems like there's not a lot of clear answers or maybe you end up you don't really know like to the extent to which you can fight for yourself Mm -hmm. right because i feel like if i was like a doctor it was in a tech world i feel like i would feel confident fighting for myself to Mm. the greatest extent but i think not only myself but other friends i have who are female friends who entered ministry there's always a question we're always asking ourselves like how do we where's the line yeah and how do we respectfully but boldly get there right um and how do we not burn out Mm -hmm. in that process (laughs) yeah yeah because that's like a heavy burden because Mm -hmm. not only are you trying to figure out your own path and like where you fit into this puzzle but you're also thinking about like I know you felt a lot of the burden of like, Mm -hmm. I'm setting a precedent, Mm -hmm. you know, and like there aren't a lot of people who went before you in this, in this like trajectory either. So I feel like you felt that weight a lot, (laughs) like what you did matter. (laughs) And I, and I, there a lot of times I really, I didn't like that. Yeah. I I think I, I, I mean, it's a big burden. Yeah. Like, um, and I never want it. Some, some people would say like, you're a trailblazer. I said, no, I, <laughs> I don't want to be a trailblazer. You know, like I never asked for that, uh-huh. you know, but I was also very conscious of the fact that to the extent to which I fight for my right to be here and like, um, m- to the extent to which I fight for like, you know, little things like even benefits mm-hmm. or how I'm treated as an employee. I knew whoever else comes after me, the same thing is going to fall on them, right? right? Because I think to this extent, what I had felt was nobody in front of me had questioned mm-hmm. those things. And so because they accepted it, mm-hmm. I was in, I inherited what had been accepted all mm-hmm. along. And I, I didn't want to be the person to pass on something that someone else would have to wrestle yeah. with. So I do think, yeah, that was a big burden of mine that I didn't necessarily ask for yeah and that was hard to carry sometimes oh yeah I bet but it is still like super admirable that you did that because I think you were in this position where like maybe you didn't ask to be there but you had to like speak up because um if you didn't then like it would be like accepting it as it were and it's not that I don't think it's like oh men are bad and they want women to stay out and like they don't want women to like have a voice it's just like maybe because women weren't in those spaces before as much like they had blind spots yeah and when you ask me like has your look outlook on life or what have you learned through that I think related to that a big thing I learned Mm -hmm. is um people don't know just because no one has ever told them before Mm -hmm. right Mm. and I I think like um I think the the temptation, I actually think the easy way to look at situations like this is to say like men are bad or like or they don't pastors care. are neglectful, right? Mm-hmm. Or they don't care for women. Actually, that's not true. And what I realize is mm-hmm. that a lot of pastors have, they want to support women and they want more women to have active voices and ministry participation. But first of all, they just don't know how right. to get there. And second of all, they're not even aware of the blind spots Mm -hmm. because no one has pointed those things Mm -hmm. out to them. Mm. And so the easy way is to point fingers, but the hard, and I think the, the better way is actually to have the hard conversations Mm. and to learn how to graciously point things out in a way where you're not accusing someone, but you're also not backing down from what the truth is. Yeah. What you think is right. Mm -hmm that's tough (laughs) (laughs) yeah and I I think I was really naive Mm. you know I think um I 
I knew in the back of my mind, like, okay, I don't really see a lot of women, so it, it's not going to be easy. But I just kind of went into it with just like this heart conviction of, I think this is what God is calling me to do. And I just want to do ministry in the church. And I entered thinking that, and then I stumbled into, whoa, yeah. like, I got to define what I even means for me to be a mm. woman in the church. I got to have all these difficult conversations with the leadership of the church. Like I got to figure out like, um, like what, what, like what is even my place? And mm-hmm. I'm like fighting for my place while I'm trying to figure <laughs> out what my place is. So it was definitely a lot more than what I had expected going right. into it. Mm, is, was this like added responsibility or like this additional part of that identity? Some, some of the reasons that you felt frustrated and like ultimately kind of led you to not wanting to be part of that environment? I mean, I don't think those were the reasons why I ended up stepping away from the church position. It was just those, it was circumstantial. Mm. Like, so I think the stepping away didn't have to do with those struggles. Um, I actually, I just, I want to say I'm so appreciative of the pastors at my church because um, they, even though we had difficult moments, like our senior pastor, Pastor Owen, he was so responsive mm. and he was willing to have that dialogue. And I really believe in the five years I was there, like there was a lot of really good change Mm. Mm. and there was a lot that was worked on and there was a lot of cultural shifts even within the staff that I'm so appreciative of. Um, And so I don't necessarily think it was like an added responsibility, but I almost feel like um, it was just part of my tenure. (laughs) It Mm -hmm. It was just part of me Going through it. Going through it, right? Me following through with my convictions came with that. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With, like, the rise of, like, um, just, like, social media and being able to, like, post, you know, and just, like, share your story with Mm -hmm. others. Like, I'm sure that there must be a community of other women in leadership that are probably talking to each other about these kinds of things. Or am I, is that, like, an incorrect assumption? No, I mean, I do, um, I think it's lacking. Mm. And I think, Part of it is like there's some trouble, I think, with not trouble, but I think one of the difficulties is obviously there's denominational differences and you end up just tending to connect with people in your denomination. Mm -hmm. So that's a limitation. Second, I think there's a lot of spaces for past like male pastors to meet each other, like pastor conferences Mm -hmm. and (laughs) meetings and stuff like that. But there's no really place for women to meet Hmm. like that. Interesting. And so um, I actually haven't met a ton of women in ministry in the similar context as me. Mm -hmm. And I I don't even know where I would meet them, Mm -hmm. (laughs) really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think there's a lot out there, um, but... I, I wouldn't even know like where to go. Really. That's really interesting that you say that. So like that same article that we were referencing early in regards to career change says something similar in regards to, well, outside of like the Christian landscape, the reason why a lot of people our age have been shifting out of jobs is it has to do with like the passion in the job in and of itself, but it's also due in part by the fact that they don't have leaders to turn to in terms of looking out, like asking what the next steps are, mm-hmm. how to advance in your career. There are no people like like me in the next level. You know, it's actually like 60% of people, that's like one of the big reasons why they leave because they have no idea how to advance, who to turn to, where to turn to advice. And so like they leave to it. go to the next level at a different company? Yeah, they're happens? actually going into totally different industries where they do see people you know, like them in the next levels where they do see people that they can turn to for advice. And it sounds like, you know, for women in ministry, that's a huge problem in and yeah. of itself. I mean, I, I wish I had someone who went yeah. before me who just told me like, Hey, these are the things you need to know, mm. you know? And I, I think what's really like weighs heavy on my heart is there are a few like younger, um, sisters who are kind of pursuing similar paths who will, you know, ask me to, to talk and they want to ask me questions and it's heavy because I see them going through a lot of similar Mm. things I went through and it's just almost like there's no um what do you call what is like the tiktok term like the canon event it's like everyone has you have to like go through it Uh. I almost feel like that's what it is is like man and I tell them like you know I try to give the best advice I can but advice only goes so far you know and 
I get torn between there's part of me that half of me like like that wants them to push through and to be encouraged and to be strong <laughs> but the other half of me knowing how hard it is mm-hmm. I almost want to say like it's okay if like, you don't want if to you don't want to you know <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I, wow. yeah. yeah and I and I think like um and, and sometimes I grieve that like there's no one older for them to look to and I end up becoming that, but I feel wildly inadequate mm. to be that person for mm-hmm, them mm-hmm. because I feel like I'm still figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I think a desire for someone above you, older than you, wiser than you to really help you, that's so big. And mm-hmm. I think for women in ministry, that's really, really hard to come by. Yeah, mm-hmm. super rare. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to also ask like, I know, I feel like you are so gifted in teaching and you're so well-spoken and so smart. I think you're like one of the smartest people I know. Thank Um, you. (laughs) Do you have like a desire to teach in any capacity, whether it's like at a church, like even if you're a member and not necessarily on staff or like going, maybe becoming like a professor or something Mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. Yeah, I do love teaching. um, And I, that's definitely an area I want to grow in. And so... I mean, I think even as a member, I've had a couple opportunities to go back and teach, mm-hmm. and I love that. Awesome. And I think just kind of through the work that I'm doing at the organiz- at TGC, like I've had a couple opportunities to like you know teach sessions here or there, or you know sometimes I'll get invited to like teach at a retreat and things like that. And so I do love those opportunities. Um, I've always dreamt of becoming a professor. Yeah, I could totally see yeah. you as a professor, mm. <laughs> but. I don't know. I, I I just I feel the limitations of my age oh. of like can I withstand going like more back school? to school uh. and going through the grind of a PhD and then going through the grind of like dealing with trying to get a job in mm-hmm. academia, right? And I think realistically as women too the idea of like if I even want to think about having kids in the next five ten years, mm-hmm. that's a huge consideration. Where does school fit in? Yeah, like, can you even do school? How do I work around my pregnancy yeah, schedule? Exactly, <laughs> and I'm sh- and I think there are women who do it, and yeah. I, it's very admirable. But I also think it's okay if you decide not to. Yeah, right. Mm. And um, and I even think that coming to terms with that came later in life too. Mm. That I don't have to push through and to break all the barriers yeah. and do all the things. And that's okay. That's mm. okay. <laughs> yeah. Just break through some barriers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. I think that's like a, a nice segue into like the final part of our conversation in terms of like this idea of delayed adulthood. Mm-hmm. Is this something that you guys have heard of before? Yeah. I think the concept of like people are just putting off bigger responsibilities in life, like getting married later having kids later. I mm. mean, that's kind of what I think of first. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, have you heard of it before? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always, like, talk about how more and more adults, like, live with their parents for mm-hmm. a longer time or um, buying a house, mm-hmm. you know, is more delayed now. So mm-hmm. I think going along with what you guys said. Yeah, I think it's, like, in part of, like, in part due to, like, the economic yeah. situation that we're in. But yeah. the fact that, you know, people are going through these quarter life crises and just figuring out who they are, you know, uh, defining success, success according to their own terms. Like that takes time. And because it takes time, I think a lot of those traditional benchmarks of accomplishing like things in your adulthood are getting pushed to the wayside Mm. uh, for a little bit. I also think like, I feel like social media has definitely played an impact, like a role in this because Uh, like you see, literally everyone in the world doing something else and being really good at it and living like a whole different life that you'd never really thought about before or you didn't really have so much like that close access to like you see people who like travel the world all the time and like live with a just a backpack or like on the opposite end of the end of the spectrum they just like do luxury travel and somehow make a living out of that Mm -hmm. and so you're just like i want to do that too and so there's that like discontentment with your own life and like wondering if you should be doing something else and like thinking that is a possibility so i feel like with all these like choices in Mm -hmm. front of us yeah it makes us want to potentially explore and be less certain about moving forward in 
our steps in front of us. That's how I kind of think about it. I think so too. I was doing some research on this earlier on census.gov. They say that most Americans believe educational economic accomplishments are extremely important milestones of adulthood. In contrast, marriage and parenthood rank lower. Over half believe that marrying and having children are not an important part of becoming an adult. So that idea and mm. notion has even just fallen off completely as a milestone of being an adult. Do you agree with this? Or is this something that you guys are kind of seeing in your life? I feel like there's so much there, yeah. right? Like there's so many like economic, yeah. societal, right. sociological changes mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. shifts that probably have led to this point. Mm-hmm. Um, like existential too. Yeah, maybe a whole generation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I do sense a little bit of that. Like if you scroll through social media, I think there's definitely a more defiance of traditional norms for, for sure. people. Mm-hmm. And so I could see why, you know, having a family, getting married, being a parent is not as important maybe to a subset of our generation. Mm, yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I and I don't know... I also think like what we see on social media or media in general of like like this the very non-traditional group subset of people I feel like they are more of a minority but they have the loudest voices too yeah. and so but then your statistics almost suggest otherwise mm-hmm. but I do think like with that narrative out there that we're hearing of like oh like basically like tradition is bad or or like saying like we don't have to do it like the traditional way and like carving out new paths Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. like people are embracing that more and hearing about that more and so i feel like that combined with probably a lot of like economic socioeconomic things factors um Mm -hmm. yeah things are getting like delayed or like people are kind of like redefining what their ideas of progressing in like adulthood means yeah yeah going off of everything that we were saying the other part of this article says that young people may delay marriage but most still eventually tie the knot in the 70s eight in ten married by the time they turn 30 whereas nowadays it's not until the age of 45 that's so late. that eight in ten that's have pretty, gotten married or get that's married a big difference it's a huge difference it's a 15 year difference basically difference. yeah and so if they're getting married later you know, we could probably presume that they're having children way, way later. And so, you know, there's like a lot that goes into that too. Mm -hmm. But I think that I agree with what you're saying. Like social media definitely does play a part into this. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also structural too, right? Hmm. So if things are getting more expensive, but you're not getting paid enough to make up for those differences and, you know, Americans, you know, what culture is notorious for, poor child care, mm-hmm. you know, poor maternal maternity leave, paternity leave, like those structures are not in place. You're going to wait longer for you to feel ready, ready yeah. to be able to commit to those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's kind of like an inevitable shift that will happen when those societal structures aren't catching up right. with other things that are changing. Mm-hmm. And more women are going to college. Yeah. I think now actually colleges have more women than men. yeah I, yeah yeah and that also means women have more opportunities for mm-hmm. jobs mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. again if you have poor child care and maternity yeah leaders, they're gonna cetera, prioritize like they're gonna career yeah because they went to college yeah right and so it's harder for them to give those things up and so i do think all of it it, it plays a part mm. well thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the yes. couch busters we are so thankful Thanks for, and having grateful for, Susan for, for, for being here i think it was an awesome conversation we hope to see you guys next time for another podcast um maybe it'll be with another guest or guests or by ourselves yeah we'll see we'll keep You'll you on your toes know. yeah you, you guys will see you next time thanks guys thank you bye, bye. sweet yeah. great job Woo-hoo.